Okay, so thanks. Of course, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this uh, extremely interesting conference and for giving me the, possi the possibility of presenting my work. So today I would like to talk about, about some uh, recent work that my collaborators and I did concerning the dynamics of mixed state entanglement after a quantum quench. And in particular, I will present some, an interesting method that uh, one can use to characterize mixed state entanglement and entanglement in, in general based on a space-time duality. So I mean, on, let's say an exchange between space and time. So uh, the setting that I want to consider is a very simple quantum quench. So we prepare uh, our system in the ground state of some local Hamiltonian, and then suddenly we uh, change, for example, the parameter of the, of the Hamiltonian or the Hamiltonian entirely, and we let it to evolve uh, with a different Hamiltonian so that the time evolution here is non-trivial. So in this setting here, I'm uh, looking at purely unitary evolution. So there is no, uh, no noise, it's uh, completely idealized, but is, there are also no measurements, it's purely unitary. And the reasons why this uh, kind of setting is interesting is because, first of all, it's very simple and well-defined. And this means that uh, we can typically do calculations, uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, even analytically, but in most cases, numerically. It is relevant from the experimental point of view. So you probably remember this picture from the talk of Sarang yesterday. So this is a famous experiment uh, called uh, quantum Newton cradles that has been realized in 2006 in the group of David Weiss in Penn State. And uh, about the quantum quants. And uh, the third point is that uh, even if it's uh, so simple, it allows us to study the main physical laws of out of equilibrium systems. I mean, the main physical processes happening out of equilibrium. And uh, the question that I would like to consider today is, are there any universal features in the dynamics of quantum many body systems? And I should say in the finite time dynamics of quantum many body systems. So when the time evolution is actually uh, still non-trivial, no relaxation has uh, kicked in. So, uh, let me, let me just say that answering this question is uh, extremely hard. And it is hard for uh, two main reasons. So the first reason is that it is extremely uh, difficult to access the out of equilibrium regime of a quantum many body system. Uh, of course, it is uh, very difficult to access it analytically. And the explanation is that all the kind of general theoretical approaches that we have are fit to work well at equilibrium, but they don't really, really work so generally out of equilibrium, and, ha and one has to come up with new uh, interesting techniques. And of course, it is also uh, difficult to describe this regime numerically, uh, as we all know. Um, but even assuming for a second that these were not problems, so that we could actually look at the dynamics of any local observables uh, we like, for uh, as long as we like, uh, I would argue that it would still be very, very hard to understand what are the universal generic features. Because by looking at the evolution of a single local observable, we, we would be submerged by observable dependent effects. So in this respect, uh, quantum entanglement is a very interesting quantity to look at. Because as opposed to many local observables, actually it can give a picture of what is actually going on in the system of, of the spreading of quantum correlations through the system without uh, having any influence of, of any specific local observable that we are looking at. So to explain what I mean more precisely, we can look at this very simple example. So let's look at the evolution of this uh, simple block A after a quantum quench. And let's look at, in particular, the dynamics of the uh, entanglement entropy, which is nothing but the von Neumann ent entropy of the reduced sensitivity matrix. So very generally, if we plot the evolution of this quantity after a quantum quench, uh, where I uh, take my initial state to be low entangled, then we will see essentially two main regimes. There will be an initial regime of linear growth of entanglement, followed by a regime in which the entanglement is gradually relaxing. So, Interestingly, this linear growth is observed uh, in, uh, in a very, very general uh, setting. So 
essentially no properties of the dynamics are, are needed to have this linear growth. So you can see this linear growth in integrable systems, you can see that it in chaotic systems. Essentially, in order to get rid of that, you, you need to uh, do something very bad to your system. I don't know, you have to introduce a lot of disorder or to cut it. But generically, this is what one observes. And then this saturation regime, actually, can be understood uh, quite simply. Indeed, if one thinks that the state of the subsystem A will uh, eventually uh, reach some sort of stationary uh, value, then essentially this plateau here will, uh, will be nothing but the thermodynamic entropy of the stationary state. Okay? Okay. So we have this very general picture. But by, by looking at that, one can also immediately ask himself a question. So uh, here we are basically saying that all this uh, flat part of the curve is uh, coming about because we are uh, essentially uh, relaxing, thermalizing. So, and essentially the entanglement that we are seeing here is uh, the statistical correlations of the stationary state. So one might uh, want to ask a more refined question and say, okay, but if I'm really interested into genuine entanglement, uh, what about looking at the entanglement of the reduced density operator instead of, 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 of the one of the pure state that is evolving so that I can get rid of this part? Okay, so one can do that. So in order to make this more refined, refined entanglement measure, one has to consider now a bipartition of the subsystem A into some parts, for example, A1 and A2. And we cannot use now the entanglement entropy as before because it's not a good entanglement measure for, for mixed states. Instead, we can use the logarithmic negativity, uh, which is defined as follows. So this is a very interesting quantity. It has been introduced in this uh, very famous paper by Vital and Werner. And it's, uh, it's, defined, uh, it's defined as follows. So essentially, one has to consider the reduced density matrix of this, uh, to the subsystem A and take the partial transpose only with respect to the degrees of freedom of one of the two parts, for example, A1. And then one takes the absolute value of the trace and the logarithm. And the idea is that if the state is separable, then taking this partial transpose will not make of my quantum state something that is not a quantum state, will, will maintain it a quantum state. And therefore, uh, the absolute value will do nothing and the trace will be one and therefore negativity will be zero. While if the state is mixed, this won't happen and the quantity will be non-trivial. So before looking at what happens to the logarithmic negativity after a quench, let's briefly discuss what happens for the logarithmic negativity on a pure state. So if uh, rho A1, A2 is a projector, so there is essentially no environment, one can uh, easily show that the logarithmic negativity is half of the Rennie half mutual information. So we saw in, in, in the morning session the definition of mutual information. This is essentially the same quantity that we, we saw there. The only difference is that it's not defined with the von Neumann entanglement entropy, but with Rennie entropies that are a simple generalization of that. And the, the interesting part of this relation is that uh, here we are saying that negativity is equal to mutual information, but as we heard also this morning, uh, yes, negativity measures entanglement, but mutual information measures uh, both quantum and classical correlation. So we expect that for a true mixed state, this, this relation would, would not be valid, would not hold. But what happens if I uh, plot the behavior of negativity after a quench? So, Essentially, I expect something of this form. So if the state is initially low entangled, I, I expect the, the beginning of a curve to be close to zero. But here, I also expect the, uh, let's say, late time part of the curve to approach a very small value. And why is that? Well, uh, to understand that, one can think of uh, a subsystem relaxing to the infinite temperature state. The infinite temperature state is separable, so it should have uh, zero negativity. Now, if instead of relaxing to the infinite temperature state, I relax to a state with a large finite temperature, this will not go to zero, will go to some small value that is set by the temperature. But the question is, what happens here in the middle? So does the negativity go up and then go down, or, or what, 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 what is typically happening here? So this is essentially uh, the motivation of, of our study. So we try to give a, a characterization 
of the behavior of uh, uh, logarithmic negativity in the early time regime, so at least in, in some window here, um, for one-dimensional systems. And this is uh, work done in collaboration with uh, Katia and Peter, who are uh, both in the audience. So um, I will now describe our setting. So if you have any question on the more general part, uh, please. Okay. Okay, let me move on then. Okay, so the setting that we consider is uh, actually uh, very general. So we will consider the evolution, a quantum quench, where the evolution is dictated by a local quantum circuit. So here, uh, we heard about quantum circuits many times during this conference. Let me just uh, run through this slide to, to explain my notation. So here, for me, these uh, 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 square blocks here are unitary matrices, while this uh, gray, I, I don't know if we can see very well the color, but these uh, gray blocks here at the bottom represent the initial state, which for uh, convenience I take in the form of a matrix product state. And in particular, in, in, in what I'm, I'm going to say, the unitary gates that form the circuit will be fully generic. So they can be, for example, position dependent or, uh, or not or, or whatever. The important point is that they are unitary. While instead, the initial state, the initial NPS, will be translational invariant. And I will also make an additional technical assumption on this NPS, which is essentially that the relation I was mentioning before between logarithmic negativity and mutual information holds on the initial state. Okay? So th this setting is indeed uh, very general, and uh, one can show that uh, with uh, circles of this form, one can approximate arbitrary well systems with uh, local Hamiltonian and finite Hilbert space. Okay, so for systems of this form, we can find very simply uh, the, following, the following property. So if we take now a tripartition of our system that is uh, as displayed here, so A bar, uh, uh, it's the rest of the system A1 and A2. So essentially a, a, by a tripartition in terms of uh, contiguous blocks. Then for Psi naught being a translational invariant MPS, we find that the relation between logarithmic negativity and mutual information holds for all times that are smaller, essentially, than the size of the smallest of the three subsystems. And this will hold up to exponentially small corrections. In fact, for product states, there will be no corrections. And in fact, we could even take the uh, product state to be non transitional environment, so with different, um, uh, different states at different sites. So, these results uh, have been uh, observed in some specific uh, settings in the past. For example, there is this uh, work here from 2019 by uh, Alba and Calabrese, where they observe that this relation holds for free systems, for free fermionic systems. And then there are, uh, there are a number of works here, I'm studying uh, only one, where they uh, find this kind of uh, relation in conformal field theories. Okay. So, but uh, how can, okay, so this result is uh, so, so simple and so general that has to have a very simple explanation, of course. So, uh, the first time I saw it, being um, a quantum dynamics person, it was actually very surprising to me. But, uh, okay, so uh, if I look at it now, then this should tell me essentially that uh, there has to be no tripartite entanglement built by the unitary circuit at, at early times. And a way to, to see that in, in a very simple case is to consider now the case of initial product states. So in this case, one can show it in essentially one line. And uh, how, how to do that? Well, the, the trick essentially is to undo the time evolution in uh, the three subsystems separately. Because uh, when we compute any entanglement related quantity, we can apply any unitary transformation separately to our uh, subsystems. So what I can do here is I can take, for example, this gate here and undo this, uh, this uh, unitary operation, this one, this one. I cannot undo this one, for example, because it stays at the boundary of the two systems. So if I remove all the gates that I can, then I can bring my state in the following simple form. And you see that a state of this form is uh, connecting only two of the three subsystems at the time. And just because of that, one has immediately that uh, uh, there, there has to be no tripartite entanglement. Indeed, for a state of this form, one can directly do the calculation and show that this relation holds. 
In, indeed, states uh, of this form has been, uh, have been characterized recently in this paper here, where they are called uh, triangle states. So, but, okay, so the question is, uh, intuitively, since it holds for, for the product states, we expect it to hold also for initial MPSs, but how to prove it? And uh, what I will present is a way to prove it, which I find very intuitive and interesting, and it's based on this uh, space-time duality that I'm going to define. So if you have any questions on, on these, otherwise I will uh, go uh, ahead with the derivation. Okay. Right. So um, to derive it with this space-time duality, we have to make two, two essential steps. So the first step is we adopt a replica trick. So we want to represent our quantities of interest as essentially some generalized partition functions. And I say generalized because uh, we heard already during the conference that one can map this kind of uh, uh, quantities to some partition functions of statistical mechanical models. But in this case, uh, these models will have complex weights. So I am not taking any kind of averaging. Everything is uh, purely unitary. So I, I just, I call them partition functions because I mean, they, they look like that, but they, uh, they have complex weights. And essentially, so for example, if I want to consider uh, Rennie entropies, then the, the, the replicative is of course very simple. Uh, I just have to take Rennie's with the integer index, and then I can represent the traces of integer powers of the reduced density matrix in this way where I have essentially to couple, so now I'm, I'm being slightly more schematic with the representation. So this now, with this green sheet here, is representing the uh, forward evolution of the quantum circuit, while with the red sheet, I'm representing the backward evolution of the quantum circuit, and essentially these red gates here are the inverse of, of, of the green ones. Okay, and so essentially in this representation, what I have to uh, keep track of is that I'm tracing out the rest of the system, so I'm connecting this copy to this copy, but I am also taking powers of the reduced density matrix, and so I have to connect uh, copies, uh, the, the part of the copy that is uh, pertaining to the system in a, in a staggered fashion. Okay, so if I do a little bit more work, I can do the same thing also for the negativity. The only thing that one has to uh, take care of is that because of the partial transpose, the way I'm connecting copies in the subsystem A1 is, is different from the way I'm connecting copies in subsystem A2. But I can do that, no, no problem. Okay, so now I, I am representing the quantities of interest in terms of partition functions, and the idea is how to contract them. Okay, so to, to, um, to see how to do that, let me consider a slightly simpler problem just to start with. So, the, the method will be no news to those uh, of you that were here last week and saw the talk of Marie Carmen, but let me just uh, uh, repeat the idea for those that, who, that weren't. So let, let's say that I want to compute the time evolution of some local observable. Then I can represent it in a quantum circuit like that. Uh, I went back to the more detailed representation. And of course, a way to, to compute it is uh, to compute the time evolution, the operator, and apply it on the state, and then apply the operator and go back. But I can contract the same uh, partition function also by looking at it uh, sideways. So I can use now, I can define a transfer operator that propagates, for example, from right to left, uh, and I call T, which is applied many times. And then there is a slightly different transfer operator that is uh, corresponding to where the insertion of the operator on top is. And so I can write my, uh, the, the same expectation value in, in the following form, right? So as, a, as the T power of the tensor matrix, here for simplicity I'm assuming that the gates are transitional invariant. I, do, I don't need to do that, it's just for, for convenience of, of notation. Okay, so I can write it like that. But then uh, the second observation that I can make is that the unitarity of the evolution gives me immediately information on w which one are the uh, leading eigenvalues of this uh, transfer matrix T. Indeed, uh, if I take T powers of this transfer matrix, and I take T to be larger than 2B max, then I can represent the powers in this way. I note here uh, there is a subtle point. So I'm taking here periodic boundary conditions, so these legs are connected to these legs here. While in, in this uh, diagram here, I'm taking these legs to be actually open, right? So this is really an operator. So these legs are open and these legs are open, okay? 
So, okay, but now using the unitarity of the evolution and the fact that I have a finite maximal velocity, uh, I can simplify this uh, uh, diagram like that, where in the middle I have uh, many copies of this uh, kind of transfer matrix that only depends on the properties of the MPS. Okay? And indeed, this object is very well known in MPS literature, is the MPS transfer matrix. And so now I can make my technical assumption. I will assume that this uh, transfer matrix of the MPS has a unique maximal eigenvalue, which is the generic case, by the way. So if I assume that, then I can essentially, for, for large enough times and axes fulfilling this inequality, I will be able to essentially truncate this by projecting on the maximal eigenvalue. So I can write this in this form. And you see then, that now I essentially wrote my uh, x power of the transfer matrix as a projector on a one-dimensional uh, subspace. And in particular, I can define these two uh, left and right eigenvectors, uh, R and L. And just by using the unitarity of the evolution, again, one can immediately show that R and L have scalar product equal to one. So essentially, for large enough uh, volumes, I will be able to write my expectation value of the observable just in terms of uh, uh, L and R. So in the Le Rose, Sonner, and Obanin, there is also a nice physical interpretation proposed for these, uh, for these quantities. Essentially, they uh, propose to call them uh, influence matrices because these are the uh, objects that are essentially encoding uh, the effect of the buff created by the rest of the system on my local subsystem. Okay? So, okay, in any case, I, I can uh, write it like that. But now, uh, an immediate question that you might ask is, okay, but uh, what, what is all this, the, all this construction buying you? At the end of the day, I will still need to construct these very complicated states. Uh, the, the point is that uh, in many interesting situations, actually, this is uh, a very big advantage. So first of all, in, there are some cases where one can compute exactly these uh, fixed points. And for, for instance, the, the most uh, general family of gates for, what, for which one can immediately compute the fixed points from a class of compatible initial state at least, are the so-called dual unitary circuits. So the quantum circuits where one has uh, the unitarity property of the gate not only in the uh, time direction as it's uh, normal, but also in the space direction. So when one can simplify gates also sideways in this way. So for these gates, one can compute exactly the, uh, the fixed points. Moreover, uh, it is also true that in, in, in many other cases, as uh, we saw uh, from the talk of Marie Carbon, one can compute efficiently numerically these, uh, these uh, uh, fixed points. And so it, it, it is giving some, some sort of advantage. But the point I want to make in this talk is that in fact, one can use this uh, construction also to, cons to, to study the entanglement, the entanglement evolution. Okay, so to, to understand how to do that, let's go back and look at our replica representation of the uh, third power of the trace of the reducency matrix. So if we do that, we um, can immediately understand something. So if I look now at this strip here, at this one, that corresponds to a region that is in the rest of the system, I can once again recognize the same transfer matrix that I was describing before for the local observable. It's just that here I will have only, uh, I will have three copies of them. So it's the tensor product essentially of three of these matrices. Okay? If I instead look at the region that is within the system, I will see that it's again three copies of the transfer matrix but they are shifted with respect to the ones of the system. So there is some permutation operator in replica space that is applied. So I can represent this object once again exactly, uh, the trace is again because I'm taking periodic boundary condition, as the following trace, where I defined uh, an appropriate permutation operator in the replica space. Uh, and once again, with a slightly more work, I can do the same also for negativity or also for the uh, moments of the partial transpose, I should say. In particular, if I uh, do it in general, well, I will get uh, a relation of this form. Where now this uh, index 2n, it, it means that I'm taking essentially 2n copies um, of, of this transfer matrix. 
Okay? But now I can once again apply the same trick as before. So if I take the size of my subsystems to be large enough, I can simplify this expression by removing the transfer matrices. And what I get is only the expectation value of these permutation operators between, sandwiched between these two, these fixed points. And before concluding, let me make just a, a final step. So now it's, it's, uh, it, this expression has an annoying dependence on the replica index because you see it's, it's appearing here in a tensor product. It's not easy to make the usual analytic continuation. But this can be uh, uh, changed very easily. So in particular, let's look at the first quantity here. And let's uh, take an above view. So now I'm looking at this uh, multi, uh, multi replica space from above, okay? From, from, from here. And then we see that essentially what we are doing with this expectation value is we have the fixed points that are coupling together two copies, one copy of the forward evolution and one copy of the backward evolution. And they are connected together in, in, by this permutation. But then if we look at these objects instead of uh, states as matrices, then we can immediately compute this quantity here and it will just have a nice analytic dependence on the replica, on the replica index. So you see here, uh, this L and R without the cat symbol are the corresponding, the matrices corresponding to the, to the state L and R. And you see that now the dependence on the replica index is very simple. In particular, the normalization of the states just implies that the trace of this matrix uh, L dagger R is equal to R. So we can rewrite immediately our expression in this form. And now we can uh, take the replica uh, limit very simply. So we just take the limit n to one and we find that indeed we have our uh, equality that we're looking at. So uh, let me just make a final uh, how much time do I have? Ah, oh, yeah, I'm almost done. Um, let me just make a final remark uh, before concluding. Uh, so if one looks at this expression here for uh, uh, Rennie entropies, uh, one can see something interesting, which is the following. So we see that the expression that we found for the Rennie entropies is, apart from a factor of two, is again written exactly as a Rennie entropy of some matrix that is L dagger R, okay? So it really, we wrote at early times the, the Rennie entropy as the Rennie entropy of the matrix L dagger R. So one can argue that this state L dagger R is somehow the stationary state that is reached by my space evolution. So essentially what, what we are saying by writing this expression is that the early time regime that I was uh, describing before, which is when the slope of the entanglement is growing linearly, can be described in terms of some sort of stationary entropy of the problem that I obtain by exchanging space and time in my original problem. And so uh, this observation actually can be used uh, in some cases, for example, for interacting integrable models to find an exact expression for this slope using the exact expression that one can find for the stationary entropy. Okay, so uh, with that, I think I can uh, summarize and essentially, I wanted to convey two points with this talk. So one is that the state at every times does not develop tripartite entanglement uh, if you just have unitary, local unitary evolutions. And the second point is that uh, one can characterize efficiently uh, and uh, um, intuitively, I would argue, um, the entanglement evolution in terms of this uh, space-time duality picture. So some outlook question, uh, that, uh, questions that one can ask is, uh, can we have a, a rigorous extension of our results to systems that don't have a strict maximal velocity? Uh, the second question that one can ask is, uh, uh, can we characterize in the same way other mixed state entanglement related quantities? And uh, well, the, the, the third question, which is probably the most interesting one is, can we go beyond this early time regime in the study of negativity? So can we understand what happens to this? So we, we just saw that in generic systems, negativity will grow now, will grow in the early time regime. But so what happens later? Uh, how, how to characterize what happens later? And what are the properties of the dynamics uh, that one needs to understand what happens later? Okay, so with that, I'm done. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you. Uh, so so you argued very, you know, you showed very intuitively how if you had a product state, then the entanglement would be strictly uh, bipartite, right? Exactly. And then you basically derived that this remains true if you have this MPS form Correct. of the initial state. Yes. Uh, do you have some intuition for what the, you know, the technical requirement you impose on that MPS um, does for you that enables this to persist? Uh, essentially, the way to, to uh, an alternative way to see that, um, to, to prove the, the property is to use some sort of renormalization group on the NPS. And essentially, uh, the, the technical requirement on the NPS is that the after, after the renormalization group, the state will be uh, trivial, will not have tripartite entanglement. So this is uh, the intuition, essentially. So if you make this requirement of the, on the NPS transfer matrix, you can prove that. So, it, it, indeed, this, can be, this, can, this reasoning can be used to prove the result again. So, you can really do a renormalization group on the MPS and, and prove the result again independently. So, in this duality approach, to, to me at least, is more intuitive, but uh, I think it, it really very much depends on what is your background. Um, so if you go slightly beyond the early time regime, so your, um, your triangles don't exactly, they're not exactly disjoint, they're sort of touching just a little bit. Is there a way of no rank approximating your corrections to the? Uh, that is a, a very interesting question. And also, uh, I, I can add on top of this question <laughs> another, another point, that is that um, in, in, in some systems you can go beyond the early time regime. For example, for dual unitary circuits. For your dual unitary circuits, you can essentially compute exactly negativity. And what happens is that there are Wait, you're saying you're saying you did it at all times? Sorry? You're saying you can do it at all times? At all times. Right, I see. At all times. Um, how, do you, how do you see that? Uh, how do you see that? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we we should discuss later. Okay. It's a it's a it's a calculation. But but for the Thanks. linear circuits, my statement is you can do it. And the point that you find is actually interesting, which is that so now we found the early time regime, which is time smaller than the smallest subsystem. Now let's uh, take the, the 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 third subsystem infinitely large. What you will find is that also for times that are uh, larger than the smallest subsystem, but smaller, uh, smaller than the second smallest, the behavior is universal. Doesn't depend on the dynamics. You know, uni dual unitary circuits can describe chaotic systems, but also free systems. And for, in that regime, you don't see that. Indeed, even in conformal field theories, they see exactly the same thing. So they see that also in this next uh, regime, the behavior is universal. So my intuition is that, uh, I think you need some more, something more than just unitarity and locality. You probably need some assumption that makes you relax to some stationary state. Uh, but then when that, when that happens, you will have something universal there. And the actual, the new universal part of the dynamics is realized only for times that are essentially larger than the, the than, than B, than the larger uh, of the two subsystems. And yeah, so this you see for both dual unitary circuits and for conformal field theories indeed. There's also a question from uh, Zoom. Uh, Tarun, right. do you want to unmute and ask? Uh, thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. Um, I had a question uh, uh, that suppose I start with an initial state which has some non-trivial tripartite entropy. Maybe let's say make it something which is even uh, sometimes uh, in some sense long range tripartite entropy. So it's, you can't just undo it by some local unitary. Do we, so is there some intuition? Do you, do you think it will not, that tripartite appropriately defined entropy will not increase under this unitary evolution or? Precisely. Or it yeah, what is the, yeah, what do you expect? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I precisely think that. I think that uh -huh. if, the, if at the beginning you have some of these, then you will uh, essentially maintain it uh, uh, at least for in the early time regime. This is my right. intuition. Uh, right. I, that was my, yeah, so, but is there some way to argue that in some way, or is there, uh, well, for, 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 for some class of circuits, at least, let's like, say, for example, for dual unitary circuits, if I start from some interesting initial state, can one show that statement? Uh, that, is a, that is an interesting question. Um, in fact, for dual unitary circuits, uh, there is this class of solvable initial states, and there, one can cook some um, solvable matrix product states that have non-trivial 
um, entanglement content. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I don't have an intuition for that. So I would really need to do the calculation. Um, right, okay. Yeah, thank you for- But no, it's a very interesting point. Thanks. There is one more question from, from Zoom. Uh, Yi Jian, do you want to unmute? Or I can repeat your question. Uh, yeah, so my question is, uh, do you assume the unitary evolution is pure unitary in your derivation, or the unitary is completely general? So, so let me repeat the question to make sure I understood. So you're asking whether the evolution I'm taking is dual unitary or completely general? Yes. Okay, it is completely general. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> If not, let's send the speaker again. Thank you very much.